भक्त वृंदिदान हे धन्या Hare 
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे राम हरे हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे हो हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 राम हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्णा हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 हम हरे हम 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 हरे 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 हम हरे हम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण 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 हो 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 हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 हम हरे हम 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 हरे हरे ताशो ताशो हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओ हो हो हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे ओ हो हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे हरे राम हरे हम हम राम हरे हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण मिठाई घर हरे हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे हम हरे हम 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 हरे मिठाई हो हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 हम हरे हम 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 हरे हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे हराय नाम कृष्ण यादवाय नम हरे हा हरे हराय नाम कृष्ण यादवाय नम हरे हरवाय हरवाय कृष्णवाय नम हरे हरवाय हरवाय कृष्णवाय नम हरि हो हरि हो हरि हो हरि हो
मुझे भाई हो हरी हो हरी हो हरी हो हरी हो भाई 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 Hai hai bhagu bhag bhagu bhag hai bhagu bhag hai bhagu bhag naam se hi nar singh hai ha 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 हम से ही नार सिंह ही फिलहाल हार नहीं ही है शिलोन सिंह पर सिंह हो सिंह नरसिंह हम धिम शर हम भक्त गए हरी 
भगवान की भगवान महाराज की शिव भगु खान की श्री हरि नाम संकीर्तन की मिठाई 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 घूम भी मोन दे मिठाई 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 पंचकल्प कृपा सिंधु पुथिता भावने वैष्णवेभ्यो नम हो नम गोर भक्त वृंद की can't see this part. Oh, go on, then you can just look at it on here. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you see, I need to, I need to do this. On that? On there. Okay. And read this at the same time. That's good. Good. So. Hare Krishna. So this is a presentation, it's a presentation on why it is more important to study Srila Prabhupada's books more deeply now than ever before. And this was a, actually it's a 95 slides, but we have reduced it to 64 for the presentation. And it's, uh, it's put together by one of my 
most dear God sisters who's very much absorbed in preaching Krishna consciousness around the world and her name is Lakshmi Moni and she has created this presentation and what we'll do is we'll go through it and then I'm going to ask each of not each of you but I'm going to ask devotees in general to read some of the things that have that appear on the screen so be ready to read so you can see this is the title and the next slide is four generations now we're talking about four generations of devotees the first generation is Srila Prabhupada he's our founder Acharya the second generation is his direct disciples that's those who were initiated by him directly third is disciples of his disciples and the fourth is disciples of the disciples of his disciples so we're going down four generations of devotees four category now in Prabhupada's books there are basically four of these principles one is issues problems that may arise or significant decisions that need to be made so there's answers to those questions that come in Prabhupada's books they're the issues instructions the information given by our founder Acharya to resolve those issues three the context the relevant situations which inspired that instruction and which shaped the particular instruction and what was the intention that the instruction was given on the goal which Peter Paul was trying to achieve in giving a particular instruction so we're talking about the instructions the issues the context that they found that they are shaped in and then what is behind so does do you ever have that problem <laughs> these are a few issues issues about initiation what is shiksha what is diksha what is vanarshram how to understand vanarshram how to apply vanarshram how to begin to apply vanarshram and preaching outreach these are just as it mentions here just a few of the issues instructions as our spiritual leader and ultimate managerial authority Srila Prabhupada left to us books lectures conversations and letters so we can see take those in the order that they're given his books as Srila Prabhupada said would be the the law books that would govern our society for the next 10,000 years so if we want to know anything about how to govern the society they are found in Srila Prabhupada's books and then of course he illustrated those in his lectures his conversations with devotees and other persons in general and then his personal letters to the different devotees so these are the categories how Prabhupada gave his instructions in these four mediums okay and his personal instructions those he gave to devotees on a one-to-one -one basis okay so who are they meant for what are they meant for when are they when do they apply where do they apply time place and circumstance so time is one thing the place is another thing and circumstances are another in other words to know how to understand Prabhupada's instructions and to apply it according to these three principles how is it relevant in this particular time like here we have a situation in the West which may be different than the situation in India so based on that we understand that there are different applications and understandings of what Prabhupada gave us, gave us. When Prabhupada 
was asked, how do you, can, how do you distinguish between these things? Prabhupada said that requires intelligence. So the intelligence comes from reading Srila Prabhupada's books and hearing his lectures. What is the intention? Why were they given? From what is the will, the mood, and the desired purpose? So here, what is the will that were, they were given behind, the mood, and what was the goal that was desired? Now, here you'll see something interesting. This is the first generation, that's us, the ones who were initiated by Prabhupada. They have pretty much direct contact with Prabhupada, so issues, instructions, and contacts and intention were easily available through Prabhupada's personal, what we say, presence and all his books. As this, the next generation goes down, we still can understand the issues, and you see the instructions seem to fade a little bit. You can see the intensity of the writing. The contact may also be less understood, and the intention sometimes is really vague. What was the, what was the intention behind the issues, instructions, like that? As the next generation goes, the disciples of the disciples, issues are still understood. Instructions become less easily understood. The context less, and intentions are probably faded completely. The fourth generation's disciples of the disciples of the disciples, the issues are still understood, but instructions, how to deal with the issues become less the context and how they were given become somewhat lost along with the intention. So we have to see how to keep these things alive as time goes on, generation after generation. The second generation, hearing from Srila Prabhupada's direct disciples. Okay, now there's not too many of Prabhupada's direct disciples left. Well, of course, there's, there are many but they're gradually leaving the planet. So. The intention is missing or fading from the second generation a little, it's gradually. The intention of our founder is not directly present and must be reconstructed by knowing the instructions and finding out the contact in which it was given. Like sometimes Prabhupada would say something and he would say the opposite. For instance, he would say, um, Krishna consciousness simply means chant Hare Krishna and that's it. But then he would say, well, you have to worship the deep. But then other times he would say it was necessary to get up early, chant 16 rounds, go to the programs, read my books, discuss my books. So Prabhupada gave different instructions about what is the essence of the practice of Krishna consciousness. So how do we understand that within the context it was given? That's why a lot of times we read the books we can't understand exactly what is being said because there are apparent contradictions. There's where time, place, and circumstance has to be understood. Okay. If these are unclear, in other words, if the, the uh, <clears throat> intentions are unclear, it leads to arguments. Devotees will argue over what is the, un the right understanding. If we don't know what is the intention behind the statement, you see the point? A lot of times we see we have that in our own experience. We speak to people and they misunderstand us because they don't understand the intention that we're speaking. So sometimes we have to make the intention clear in order for people to understand the statement given. Not always, it's not. So Prabhupada's books, as his lectures, especially his lectures are like that. Sometimes a different understanding gets stifled and confused. And so because of that, the, a different understanding, which is also correct at a certain time, is not an, is is 
what we say stifled it means it's not able to present itself properly and we get confused understanding. So third generation, all of Srila Prabhupada's disciples are gone. Now we are hearing from disciples of Srila Prabhupada's direct disciples. The missing content, the missing is the content and the instruction. This must be reconstructed by memories from those who associated with the direct disciples. Hmm. So what Prabhupada said is understood by those who are directly present and can communicate that to others. We hear sometimes uh, Shruti Kirti Prabhu will go around and speak about Srila Prabhupada and having personal association, he will explain what Prabhupada said and what he meant when he said what he meant. So a lot of times we can just take what he said and not understand the intention behind it. Mm -hmm. or, the, or the in context that was given in. Fourth generation, all association with those who are directly associated with Srila Prabhupada is now gone. So then, missing direct instructions, content, and intentions. So what I'm, what this, what this part of this presentation is, is laying the groundwork for the solutions. First, we're hearing about the problems that do arise and have arise within our society. And then we'll see what is the way to solve these problems. These now need to be reconstructed by a relevant system of education and careful study of the instructions that he left us. Okay, so now, there, we don't understand directly what the instructions, what the content is, or what the intention is. So now, this needs to be, again, presented in such a way that we study it and understand exactly what was meant. Okay, so now we're going to ask one devotee to read. Prabhupada's comment. Ready? Who wants to read? Just read as loud as you can. Anyone? Prabhupada comments, all the devotees connected with the Krishna consciousness movement must read all the books that have been translated, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, and others. Otherwise, after some time, they will simply eat, sleep, and fall down from their position. Thus, they will miss the opportunity to attain an eternal, blissful life of transcendental pleasure. Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya 25.278. This is one of, one of the landmark statements that Prabhupada made in such a way that he, he, he said simply, if we don't read and understand his books, we will not have, the intelligence will not be in, inspired. And when our intelligence is not inspired in spiritual life, we will again return to material activities. Because we are made up of, of senses, mind, intelligence. And so we use our senses in mind, but the intelligence also requires stimulation from transcendental knowledge. And that comes from reading and understanding Prabhupada's books and also how to present that knowledge to others. Okay, someone else? Don't be shy. need arises, you can repeat in your own words their purport. As much as possible, read, chant, and preach. This is our life and soul. If we keep to this simple formula, then there is no doubt that we will be victorious wherever we go, and very soon we will become the only religion in the world. SPL to Herdayananda, 6th of January, 1972. SPL means Srila Prabhupada's letter to Herdayananda Maharaj. And so here, Prabhupada's saying then, we will, if we read as much as possible, chant, and also preach, then we will be equipped that everywhere we go, we will be able to present our philosophy, and always, and there will be, it will be undefeated in any situation. And then he said, we'll become the only religion in the world. What does that mean? That means that people will understand the importance of worshiping Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, nugget next one. Avoiding 
ten offenses. Don't take this movement as something cheap. Srila Prabhupada's letter to Sruta Dev Das. So here, again, Prabhupada is emphasizing the importance of having faith in Guru and Shastra. So that faith comes through studying scrutinizingly. What is scrutinizingly? How, how would you apply that in this case? What, what are we actually saying? That means you, can, you not only just read it, you try to read it, review it, understand it, see how it applies to you, see how you can actually make it happen in your day-to-day -day life. In other words, you take it down to its essence. And so this was a very powerful statement, getting right to the point. And Prabhupada says, chant 16 rounds and avoid the offenses. Okay. Okay, another letter? Someone? Nice and loud. More and more, and try to understand the subject matter from different angles of vision. And be always discussing it with your God brothers. And when you are working and you cannot read, then listen to the tapes of my lectures and hear in that way. And never neglect to chant your 16 rounds of beats daily. Rise early without fail, attend Mangalarti, take bath and follow the other regulatory principles and everything will come out very successfully. You can rest assured of that. Prabhupada says, everything, you follow this simple formula, everything will come out. So you might say, well, I live outside, I don't live in the temple. These were statements were made when we only had a temple movement. Everyone who was practicing Krishna consciousness when Prabhupada was here, especially in 1972, were temple devotees. There was no congregation. Now we see the dynamic, dynamic has changed. Um, practically 85, 80 to 85 percent of our devotees are grihastas who live outside with family and work. Therefore, it's incumbent and also essential that we establish in our homes also a morning program where we can chant Mangalarti and practice Krishna consciousness in that environment. With our family, we can invite friends to come. We can also do that within the community. But these things are important because they purify our consciousness. And Prabhupada says, then everything will come out very successfully. When Prabhupada says, you can rest assured of that, you can, that means you can rest assured of that. <laughs> There's no other way. Prabhupada's statements, he doesn't make eulogies or false promises. He's speaking from realization. He's saying, this formula will make you successful. Discuss my books from different angles of vision. Bodhiyantas parasparam katiyantas chimam nechan tushyanticha ramanticha. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, my devotees derive great happiness and pleasure discussing the, about me and my transcendental pastimes. So this is this what gives devotees great pleasure to hear about Krishna, talk about Krishna, and discuss it from different angles of vision. This makes us Krishna conscious. Another one? anything which you do not understand, then you simply have to read again and again. By reading daily, the knowledge will be revealed to you. And by the process, your spiritual life will develop. So here's the point. When you don't understand it, reread it. Reread it, reread it until you get it. Uh, Prabhupada, spiritual master, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, how many of you have seen that uh, presentation of uh, Brahma Samhita by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati? The English language is impossible for English people. It's so erudite. He uses the most erudite English. And so Bhakti Siddhanta wrote that as a commentary from Bhakti Vinod Thakur's commentary, who wrote that from Jiva Goswami's commentary on, Bhak, on Brahma Samhita. 
So we got it, and we're reading it, and we're thinking, how do we understand this? The Transcendental Autoclave cannot, the, the, what is that, the, the conditioned soul cannot reach to the Transcendental Autocrat who was ever inspiring the conditioned souls. It, it's just the highest fluent English you can imagine. This was Bhakti Siddhanta. That was his second language, too. And he's bewildering the, the English-speaking people. So the Bodhi said, Prabhupada, we can't understand this. Why don't you write a commentary on your spiritual master's commentary? <laughs> and this was Prabhupada's. Basically, he responded in this way. If you don't understand it, just read it again, read it again, read it again, and finally it'll start to reveal itself to you. So that's how you kind of penetrate something that is hard to understand. Repetition, repetition like that. It's not so much how much you know, is but even if you know a little in a realized way, it's better than knowing a lot theoretically. So we want to understand, just like we hear, I am not this body. Okay, how many times have we heard that? <laughs> Hundreds of times. But do we realize it? I mean, realizing means lights go off and sirens start blasting and everything becomes clear. In other words, you don't have to understand, oh, yes, I know I'm not this body. I've understood it by realization. Realization is knowledge that has reached its perfection. How is that understood? Using a comparison. You could go into a restaurant. You can sit down at the table. They give you a menu. And you read the menu and think, oh, boy, that's so nice. You, you put the menu down and you say, that was a wonderful meal. <laughs> so you sort of came in contact with the food simply by reading about it, hearing about it. But how much have you realized about the experience of eating? That comes with the actual eating itself. So when we read something, that's theory. But when we actually understand it, deeply, that is called, it's called Gyan and Vigyan. Gyan means knowledge and Vigyan means Vishita Gyan, which means that knowledge which is realized. The difference between theory and realization. So that's what Prabhupada is saying. Read it again and again, you'll finally realize it. Okay. Okay. So, someone read this. This is a verse from uh, Sveta Svatara Upanishads. Someone read this. Sanskrit. Yasya deve para bhakti yatha deve tatha guru tasya ete gatita hi artha prakashante mahatmanaha. One who has got unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord and similar faith in his spiritual master, to him only the, only the imports of Vedic knowledge become revealed. So, here that's, what is that saying? That by that faith, then we can de deeply understand what is being said. What is that faith? Faith in Guru, faith in Krishna. Like that. Three types of study. Okay, here's how to study. Personal study, you're reading by yourself. Group study, with groups together, studying and discussing. And then the last is systematic group study, uh, someone giving a presentation on some particular, like here, Bhakti Shastra course, like that. At Shruti Dharma Prabhu, the president of Bhakti Vedanta Manor. Okay, prayerful reading, a good systematic study, personal study. So here's a little bit about reading in a prayerful way. So, someone can read? Carefully listen to Krishna's message. Let potent transcendental words, 
drink, I'm sorry, sink deeply into the core of our constitutions. Consti consti yeah. So by reading carefully in the prayerful me, now these books are deities. Prabhupada said, Bhagavatam is none different than Krishna. And the different cantos of the Bhagavatam correspond to the different parts of Krishna's transcendental body. And so, when we approach the books like we would approach the deity on the altar, then we're actually approaching the books in the right way. So just like um, in some temples, we take the books and we put them on the altar. I know in one temple in Italy, they have Prabhupada's books on the altar and other places. Some places, they put garlands over the books and also do pujas to the books. Um, others' religious tr traditions also do that with their scriptures too. So we see the books not simply as, you know, books or something that contains knowledge, but emanations of Krishna's transcendental body coming in the form of literature. So this is called, um, this is called Granta Bhagavatam, within that, or what we say, that Bhagavatam, that is Krishna himself. Krishna in transcendental sound, like that. Okay, okay, this is now, this is, pay attention to this part, because this is very helpful. Um, here's ten points on how you can read the books. These are very nicely uh, given. Suggested steps when beginning to practice prayerful reading. Okay, who, do we have a reader for this one? Who has the microphone? Okay. First one. Decide on what you will read. Okay, decide on what you will read. Okay. Second. Decide how long you will read for. It is up to you. So, you can choose how long, but make, make a time period before you start, and then you can choose. Okay. Third one. Go to a place where you can be alone with the book, uninterrupted and quiet. Makes sense. Fourth, make yourself comfortable, but don't fall asleep. <laughs> we have that problem sometimes. <laughs> I remember in the old days when we wanted to rest, all we did was pick up a book and it became easy because we were always so tired from working, so we would sit down and fall asleep immediately. But that's not the idea. Make yourself comfortable so you can focus, but don't fall asleep. Five, cultivate an appropriate attitude. Okay. Six, before starting, you may offer prayers. So, Srimad Bhagavatam, Sila Sanatana Goswami has written prayers in glorification of Bhagavatam. That's one suggestion. Or well, we can offer individual prayers, offering our pranams to the books, offering prayers. And that, that inspires Krishna to reveal more of the knowledge when we approach in a prayerful way. Seven, <clears throat> when you are ready, begin reading. Read aloud or silently. So that's up to you. Some people like to read loudly and someone will like to read silently. You may choose whatever you find comfortable with. Eight, <clears throat> read until a word, a phrase, or an idea strikes you or catches your attention. Strive to understand it deeply. Okay, so here's a little method. You're reading, you're reading, you're reading. Oh, something has, strikes your attention or you don't understand it. Try to understand it by reading it again and again and thinking about what you read. Nine, when your time is up, offer obeisances and try, 
for any realizations that may have been offered to you. Uh, yeah, try to understand, give realizations that may be offered to you. Jai Shri Sri Kishore 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 So, you're reviewing your reading now. And the last one is... 10. Assimilate into your life what you have read and realized. Read Srila Prabhupada's books in this fashion as much as you can. So these are ten steps that you can apply for effective reading. Anybody who wants these ten steps, you can just give your email address to Shiv. Shiv, raise your hand. There he is over there. And I'll send you these ten steps as a separate document. Okay, move on now. Reading with devotees or getting the most out of what you read. Okay. First read and or hear as explained before. First read and hear as explained previously. And then repeat and explain amongst others. So here's one way to memorize. You want to memorize something? Repeat it. This is the formula for memorization. You read something, uh, one great devotee in our movement did a little survey. No, he didn't do a survey, he found a survey. This survey was done in America about retention of knowledge. So, people generally remember 10% of what they read, 10%. It's not very much. People generally remember 20% remember of what they hear. People generally remember 30% of what they see. People generally remember 50% of what they see and hear together. So now, when we present something in a visual way and we speak about it, the retention level comes up to 50%. People remember 70% of what they do, and people remember 90% of what they teach. So here's the formula. If you teach or speak what you know, your retention level becomes almost full, like that. So here's the key. And it's a natural it's the nature of the, the living entity to remember what we speak about. Yes. Huh? Um, it's going to be pretty hard to respond to questions because... Uh, keep your question for the end. Is that okay? So, repeating what you're hearing or reading means you will retain it more and more. It becomes easier. And if you think, oh, well, who am I going to repeat it to? Well, if you're married, talk to your husband or wife, your friend, or just somebody. Oh, did you know I read this today? I read the Bhagavatam and it was the story, and then all of a sudden you start speaking Krishna Gata. So think of ways to not only to read or hear, but also to speak it like that. Ask questions about what you read and what you heard. Discuss, we, we discuss it from different angles of vision. And apply what you learn in your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaking to his, some of his disciples, some of his students. Yeah. So a teacher speaks and the students listen and they discuss it, they ask questions and they learn how to learn how to apply. Application is the conclusion. If we just somehow read Prabhupada's books and it's nice philosophy and it's, we can't figure out how to apply it in our life or we don't understand it enough to apply it, then we're missing the actual essence of what, why it's been given. 
this knowledge is meant to become realized in practice in life. Because it is transcendental and it leads to Krishna. <laughs> and share your experiences with others, okay? What to look for when you read? What, what picture is this? Who are this? Six Goswamis of Vrindavan. They used to come together every morning at a certain time, very early in the morning, and they would sit together and they would discuss their writings and their realizations on philosophy. It became a regular affair. They would spend many hours just talking about what they had written. Okay. Okay, so here's a little chart. Knowledge is memory and recall. It's also understanding and realization. Personal application is preaching, how to take how to realize it on a personal level, preach it, and then of course the philosophical theological application. And then values and attitudes. Faith and conviction, evaluation, what is the mood and mission, what is the authority, academic and moral integrity, and responsibility for learning. So you have knowledge, you have skills, these are skills, this is knowledge, and this is values and attitudes. Any comments on this? You can see how knowledge expands itself into skills, skills into values and attitudes, and these are the subcategories in each of the three. So when you get into values and attitudes, then you can speak from authority. It has integrity, even on the academic level. And then actually you develop a sense of responsibility for learning more and more. And it's a little bit theoretical here. A little, any questions about this part? At least you can ask questions on. Okay, so, theoretical knowledge, okay. From that comes understanding, from that comes application, from that comes realization, and from that comes higher thinking, skills, and values. We apply these in our workplace, right? The people, when we go to work, sometimes in the office, they tell you, okay, understand what I'm getting, now learn how to apply it, can you, can you speak it to others, and then you develop a particular skill based on the knowledge you develop. So this is, this is it's also Krishna consciousness. It's not enough to know the theoretical knowledge. We have to move forward and understand it. If someone comes and says, oh, you're a Hare Krishna, what do you believe in? Oh. What do you say? They say, you're a Hare Krishna, and uh, you believe in worshiping cows. What, do you, what would you say? <laughs> you, you say, yes? That's not enough. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you have to understand it, and then how is that applied? And why? And then, living in that environment. And so it, this is taking knowledge to its ultimate principle. Okay. Knowledge. Okay, someone read. So that push, knowledge pushes us in a certain direction. So you can see Krishna is there. We're thinking about Krishna. Understanding? Deepening your understanding of the Krishna consciousness theology, particularly through studying it from a wide range of perspectives and through developing thoughtfulness and introspection. Yeah, so read it, discuss it, think about it, ref reflect on it, and then it becomes deeper and deeper. This knowledge that we have been given is not just philosophy. It's transcendental realization of the nature of bhakti and the nature of Krishna. 
it's completely above the material. So it's not so easy, and I mean, it's not so limited as material knowledge is. It's deeper and deeper and deeper. So when we read, we can study it, we can see it from different angles, think about it. Oh, what is Krishna saying here? What is my spiritual master actually saying? And then we reflect on it. And sometimes we ask questions based on that. Just like the hearing process. The hearing process works in four principles of itself. Just like I'm speaking. So what is the, what is the principle for hearing? You have faith in the speaker, okay? The speaker's gonna give you something that he, he understands and he, he can communicate to you. So you have faith in the speaker. The second thing is you have humility. Humility means you're able to assimilate what is being said without a challenging spirit. You hear it and you take it in. The third is when your mind wanders, which it does, just like when someone is speaking, sometimes our mind wanders to something else. It happens all the time. And sometimes we wander for a long time. Sometimes we wander so long that when we come back, we've missed half the class. <laughs> and sometimes it wanders so long that we actually leave the class just to follow the wandering mind. <laughs> so, but the third principle is called destroying the faults of the mind. That means every time the mind wanders, bring it back. Bring it back to the sound that's being ex uh, expressed. Just keep hearing, keep hearing. And then the th fourth part is the results of the first three. So through faith in the speaker, humility, and keeping the mind focused, two things happen. One is you get realizations of what is being said. Oh, yes, yeah, I understand that. And the second is questions arise. If we're not getting either realizations or we're not asking questions based on what it's saying, that means we weren't listening. So we'll either get one of the two, realizations or questions like that. So that comes from the second one. Okay, someone else? Yeah, so Shravanam Kirtanam doesn't only mean chanting, but it means also hearing and explaining. So hearing and then, of course, explaining. So we talked about that. Discussion. Okay, now this is a discussion question. Everyone read this and give your analysis of what is being said here. So we're going to ask some of the devotees, you ready? Okay, those of you who are focused, and those of you who are not focused, focus. <laughs> okay, read this carefully and try to understand what is being said. So I'll ask a few devotees to explain it in your own words. You ready? Is this fair? Okay. Okay, someone read it. Anyone? Someone read it out loud. Where, where's the Where's the uh, microphone? Okay. So this is a discussion question. We did this together when Lakshmi Moni made this presentation. We got so many different different exp explanations of this same thing. So you can see, it's not so easy. Okay. The Kripanas or miserly persons waste their time in being overly affectionate for family, society, country, etc. In the material conception of life, one is often attached to the family life, namely to wife, children and other members on the basis of his skin disease. The Kripana thinks that he is able to protect his family members from death 
or the Kripanas thinks that his family or society can save him from bridge of death. Such a family attachment can be found even in the lower animals who take care of their children also. Bhagavad Gita 2.7 purport. Okay, who wants to venture into this? Anyone? No one. I'm sure everybody's eager. Okay. Chandra. Okay. What is it, what's being said here? Well, first of all, uh, when they talk about miserly persons, they're actually they're doing a couple of things three times in the first sentence. They're talking about miserly people and then wasting time. And then they talk about the affection. So that time is wasted on the affection for family. And the thing that came to mind, I was thinking about the two lovebirds who spent so much time uh, thinking about their family, thinking about how they're going to plan for the family, loving each other, so absorbed in each other's uh, affection for one another, as opposed to the end when death came, uh, I believe the father bird was saying, you know, I could have been spending more time thinking about God. So this is an idea. Miser means to put your time in something other than God. So that doesn't mean necessarily that the family can't be involved, but if it excludes God, then it becomes miserly. Uh, the same thing applies in society. We become so proud of this bodily distinction on I'm American, I'm German, I'm Indian. So everything becomes pride associated with some landmass, right? Which could get blown up at any time. So these things are temporary. They're, they're, um, they're not eternal. They're not, again, connected. Now, if a person is thinking, I'm thinking of my country because I'm thinking about God, then we actually should be thinking about the entire universe or universes. So it's broader than just some localized place. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, this material conception of life, which is uh, I'm the center of everything. I am the core of everything. Uh, I should be served. I'm the Lord of everything I, I, I survey. So every, we're thinking in a self-centered way. So this is also extended to society and country. And it's also another extension of, um, of, of our sex attraction, you know, rather than just simply thinking about, you know, uh, how can I produce, but it becomes family, then it becomes country, it becomes this pride about associating my block, my clan, my this, this, that, and the other. So you see that this attachment to family life, to wife and children and other, other members and friends on the block, all these things surround the person so that they're specifically thinking these things engrandize me. I'm the center, right? And I'm why, important. Why, why is that wrong? Why is that wrong? Again, Krishna is not the center. We can't be the center of everything. We're marginal, right? We're marginal living entities. So therefore, it makes no sense. We can't save our family members, nor can we save ourselves. So the saving process is to uh, put that faith and attention in Krishna appreciating that he's created these situations that I can have fellowship and so we should be thanking him about that association with family and friends so forth and so on. So we also move to the basis of skin disease. This skin disease is that we completely identify with our body. Not okay. knowing, not now, knowing, go ahead. Now you're getting into the essence, okay. okay. So not knowing that we've been an ant, we've been a dog, We've been a molecule, we've been a worm and stool. We move from one false identification to another, not understanding that this is simply a dis disease of the skin. And deeper than that, it's a disease of the consciousness associating that I'm this and, body. And what level of existence is this on? You're pointing at the bottom? Oh, yeah, lower animal consciousness, because animals, that's what they do. Dogs and cats are fighting because I'm a dog, you're a cat, you're my enemy. This is also in the Bhagavad Gita, when the person who's, um, uh, he's demoniac. We talk, we talk about the divine and the demoniac. And I shall conquer, I shall give in charity, I shall be famous, I shall kill my enemy. So this is a dog mentality, dog and cat mentality. Animal life means, right, to um, only be thinking about your specific needs, how can I enjoy my senses, and how uh, others may interrupt that process of me enjoying my senses. I'd be even willing, like lions do, to kill cubs because it may interfere with their sense gratification. So, I'm sorry, let me go back. What does 
What does Kripana mean? It means to be miserly. What does it mean to be miserly? It means to be wasteful. In other words, to be, uh, you, uh, you use the example with Arjuna. Arjuna is approaching Krishna with that, uh, you know, excuse me for my miserly weakness. I'm thinking that I should retire in the forest, right? I shouldn't fight in this battle. That miserliness is associated with not serving Krishna. Krishna has a specific mission in mind and we should be part of it. But when we're thinking I have a better plan, I don't want to follow my dharma, I don't want to follow my duty, my occupation. I just want to conserve and be self-centered again, so we're just being miserly. So this miserliness for Chatriya simply means that he's not doing his duty to protect others. He's only thinking about his self-interest. It's more like shrunken consciousness, seeing your family, your country, your society as everything, and you are a member of that, and you can't see anything out of that, outside of that, and you identify that as being you and your success in life. It's animal consciousness. Yes. And so what does the word skin disease refer to? That's body attachment. I think I'm the body. I mm. fall in love with the body. The body is the body beautiful. Why does the word disease mean? Uh -huh. Because the body, as Prabhupada has mentioned, that the body is simply, we don't get cancer. Uh, the body is a cancer because it doesn't last, right? The body has so many undesirable aspects to it. And the reason for that is because we don't use it in an appropriate fashion. Again, that gets back to being miserly. Not because we don't use it, it's because we don't know what it's for. We don't know the purpose. And we don't really care either. <laughs> Anybody else would like to say something on this verse? Anybody, any bold? How about some of the ladies? Any of the ladies want to tackle this one? Yes, we got one over here. Mother Bonnie, or I think, is it Bonnie or someone? Anyone know? Okay, Bonnie's up here in the front. It's nice to discuss what Prabhupada is writing. Just make it just to the point, brief, a few sentences. So when I, when I read this paragraph, I would think that it means that people who don't have much mercy, that are cheap, miserly, they only have this affection for very, the people that are associated with their body. Yeah, very good point. Extremely excellent point. This is the main point. They only see, oh, my family, and that's all that counts. Everybody else can go to hell. <laughs> because it doesn't really matter to me. Like my child has all these good qualities. I don't really see them in other people's children. Maybe sometimes, but not so much. Yeah. yeah. My kid gets, my kid is the best kid in school because it's my kid. <laughs> you know, very shrunken consciousness simply based on the immediate family attachment. Okay. I'll tell you a funny story. You want to hear something? This is kind of, this is a true story. And I was in London and I was riding with one person. One person was telling me about this one lady. She went before the deities, Rashisi Radha Gokulananda Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman in London. And she had a son in school. So she's praying to the Lord, my dear Lord, please get my, let have my son have A's in all his subjects. Please, she was like really emotional, begging. Uh, he's got 10 subjects, please give him all A's. So the boy got nine A's, not 10. So she came back and she complained to the Lord, I asked for 10 A's and you only gave nine. She was unhappy. <laughs> so what is that? The Lord becomes your, you know, order supplier. And if you, so if you give me what I want, Lord, then, you know, then I'll even give you a donation. Maybe two. <laughs> so using the, trying to use the Lord to bolster one's family success right? on a material platform. Okay. Another statement. It is not blindly accepted that this Krishna consciousness, it is not blindly accepted, this Krishna consciousness, with considerable deliberation, we take the decision. So, 
In other words, we don't accept things blindly, we discuss it and we understand it. Okay? Jai, who knows where that's from? Balaram. Krishna Balaram? Is that New Mayapur in France? Anybody know? Anyway, it's beautiful. Sikhsi Krishna Balaram Ki Jai. See, this, 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 this presentation is not so hard. It's, it's nice. We even makes it sweet. Okay, personal application. What does this have to do with you? Okay, someone read. Vaishnava qualities and behavior. So the theology leads to the practice and internal development. From internal development, one's qualities and behavior. So when Prabhupada was asked, how do you understand who is a Vaishnava? Prabhupada said he's a perfect gentleman. Or a perfect laity. Later means in other ones, one who gives regards to others. So by knowledge Practice develops, and by practice, internal mood develops. From internal mood, proper qualities manifest, and then they came out in form of behavior. <laughs> behavior is the essence of a Vaishnava's, uh, what we say, expression to others. <laughs> okay? Thila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, who's that guy on the bottom there? Okay. Someone want to read? Vigyana. So a parrot, he can, he can speak verses. They can. We can teach parents. But if you ask him, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, what does it mean? He'll just speak the verse again. That's all. <laughs> so just reading and memorizing is nice, but it's not enough. It's not enough. We have gyan means philosophical understanding. Vigyan means realization. So we have to go from Gyan to Vigyan, like that. Yeah. Nice looking parrot. Hmm? Okay. Shishi Radha Samasundar Kija. Beautiful. Okay. Preaching application. What does it do? To enhance your desire and ability to preach effectively, to reach others with this message of Krishna consciousness. Well, we're not satisfied simply by having a nice community and looking at each other and patting each other in the back and saying, well done. We want the whole world to become Krishna conscious. Prabhupada came to make the whole world Krishna conscious. He didn't want us to be like a little religion that's satisfied by making chapatis and, and uh, you know, smiling at each other. You're nice, I'm nice, we're all nice. Haribo. No, he wanted us to go out and be instruments for his mercy. And you can see Prabhupada met, you see Prabhupada in two quite dichotomic, this was on Hippie Hill in 1967 when he's amongst all the hippies, they're all drug-crazed hippies who are dancing, some of them not so well-dressed. And here, he's talking to some theologians on what we say scholarly principles. So Prabhupada went from one extreme to another, and then of course, always willing to bring that knowledge wherever he had a chance to make it known. Okay. Okay. A letter. Someone read. 
wish to encourage all my disciples to very carefully learn this philosophy of Krishna consciousness because there are so many preachers who will be required to bring this message to all corners of the earth. Yeah. Prabhupada wants everyone to learn and to be able to speak. Someone else? speak them in your own words do not adultery adulterate or change anything then you will be the perfect preacher okay memorize the verses and purports speak them you can describe them in the way you understand them don't don't change the meaning this is adulteration means the meaning you may change how you explain it but the meaning should not be changed and then you'll be, what we say, a perfect preacher. So memorize. And Prabhupada says, if you want to preach, what do you do? Read. Read, 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 read. And then you'll preach like that. Okay. Okay, this is Prabhupada's movement, not just simply to understand, but to explain, apply in a wide range of... In other words, you can take one verse, you can explain it in your personal way, from a social point of view, from the moral principles, how it, what are the topics, and even from the theological, theological issues that it explains. So there's different ways to see the knowledge and there's different angles of vision on how to apply these, this knowledge. The Bhagavad Gita is spoken by the Lord so that human society can be perfectly organized from all angles of vision, politically, socially, economically, philosophically, and religiously. From any point of view, human society can be reformed by the Krishna consciousness movement. This is, this is a lamb. From any point of view, politically, socially, economic, and philosophically, and religiously, we have answers. These books are not just about God, but they're about how to take that knowledge and structure society in these ways, politically, Socially, economically, philosophically. Prabhupada talks a lot about the ideal rulers. What is an ideal ruler? What is his qualifications? What does he do? What is, what is it about his rule that makes him so successful? Mm -hmm. So you find from different angles these things it's, so the Prabhupada's books and even his lectures contain politics, sociology, economics, just like Prabhupada says. Economics is based on the principle of family. So as soon as you get married and you have, have a family, then you become an economic, what we say, cog in the wheel of society, and therefore you both produce and you, both, and you also consume. And so, therefore, economics is based on family, to propagate family within society who contribute to the society and also consume the products that are being pro produced. So that's economics. I think Prabhupada said that's Marshall's theory of economics. Prabhupada said, I was a student of Marshall <laughs> when I was in college. <laughs> so that's just an example. Krishna Balaram Ki So both faith and conviction. So here, faith. Okay. Nice for Prabhupada just giving us faith. What is faith? Faith is the complete conviction that simply by serving the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, one can achieve all perfection. After reading Bhagavad Gita, one should give up all other engagements and adopt the service of the Supreme Lord, Krishna. If one is convinced of this philosophy of life, that 
So faith, you can see the word is in capital letters, all the letters. Now, that is faith when one has complete faith that simply by serving the Lord, everything will be successful in life. Or we might even say that one has complete faith that simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, one can achieve all perfection in life. That is faith. <clears throat> and that faith comes by association. That faith comes by reading Srila Prabhupada's books. Okay. Faith. So how faith? How is faith created by association with devotees? Okay. Queen Kunti prayed, I wish that all those calamities would happen again and again so that we could see you again and again. For seeing you means that we will no longer see repeated births and deaths. So that's from Bhagavatam, the prayers by Queen Kuti. <clears throat> She's praying. She's a queen. She has royalty. She's surrounded by opulence. She's worshipped as a very respectable person, as both a queen and as a great devotee. But what is she praying for? What is she asking for? Calamities, why? What? She's asking that difficulties come. Why? Because I'm too materially comfortable and therefore I forget you. I'm forgetting you and that's worse than death. Therefore, if you give me some difficulties in life, then that can cause me to call out you with great feeling and love. So here's a, here's a principle of success. When we find our, isn't, isn't it true that when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, God becomes more important? <laughs> it's just natural. Right? They used to say there's no atheists in the foxholes. <laughs> what does that mean? That we, of course, we run into calamities in our life, but she's in a comfortable position. And she's saying, give me calamities. Why? Because my comfort is making me forget you. And that's worse than, the, than having calamities. So if I can remember you through calamities, then that's my success. So she's praying for that. And then, and she says, she ends, if by seeing you again and again, then we don't have to take birth again in this material world. So this is a very powerful player by Queen Kunti. Someone else? Whatever the case, we must have the faith in the world of Krishna. When we purchase a ticket, Okay, so the point is that something the, inspires faith when it's authorized or recognized. So by reading and studying in association, we understand that this knowledge and tradition and practice is coming down from Krishna. It's not something that was created by Srila Prabhupada or by people in the last few hundred years. It's not only authorized, it's been practiced successfully for thousands and thousands of years. So we have history, we have tradition, we have scriptures, we have examples that shows that everything is in line. Therefore, we can say, just like the example is being used here, okay, you're going to, you want to fly somewhere and you buy a ticket. You buy it, you wouldn't buy a ticket on an airline that was called, we might get you there, okay. <laughs> We we'll give you a cheap ticket, and if we don't get you there, then we will refund it. And if you die in our in the process, we'll pay for the burial. No, <laughs> that's not. You know, you wouldn't buy that ticket. <laughs> you want to buy, so you always say the most reputable, the most authoritative 
uh, ways for travel, you might accept that because you have, you know, by their record that they will have success. So in the same way, we have to understand that this tradition is not something new. <laughs> and it's been practiced successfully for thousands and thousands of years. And therefore we can have faith in the process because it's time tested. And there are examples of people who have successfully become self-realized through this process. Any questions on that? Yes. How does this? She has complete faith that if simply by remembering Krishna, everything will be successful. And therefore, she's only praying for that, nothing else. So whatever it takes to remember you, then that's what I'm, she's eager for. She has complete faith that remembrance of Krishna is, is, the, is the perfection of life which causes one to be free from the cycle of birth and death. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. So that connects to this, yeah. So faith is there. Faith is created because it's, when this process is authorized. Okay, where's that? Who knows? Vrindavan, Sri Sri Gornitai, Sri Vrindavan Dham Kijai. Where's Prabhupada there? Who knows that? Where? New Vrindavan? Is this New Vrindavan? I think this is Bhakti Vedanta Manor, isn't it? Look at the window behind it. Yeah. Bhaktivedanta Manor, that's Prabhupada in Bhaktivedanta Manor in London. Okay, next is evaluation. Help you develop analytical, interpretive, and evaluative skills, particularly in respect to practical application of Shastric knowledge. Who's that character? Can anybody explain this? <laughs> okay, so you, you need analytic, interpretive, and evaluative skills to, to take care of this one, right? <laughs> so the same with Shastra. What does this say? Who knows Sanskrit? Atato Brahma Jignasa. Huh? Atato Brahma Jignasa. Atato Brahma in the human form of life now, understand your relationship with God. How to develop these things, which are analytic, interpretive, and value, in particular when it comes to Shastra, okay? So we see a little. So you're on the path, you could go in different directions. It branches in different ways. The ability to give advice or counsel, etc., that is actual, relevant, and practically useful to society. Okay. And develop the ability to make appropriate choices in your personal life. Okay. So we, we're, how many of us are faced with choices every day? Yeah. Okay. Do you sometimes make the wrong choice? And then what happens? maybe even learn from the mistake and you understood what was right afterwards. So by, by analyzing, evaluating, and even explaining scripture, we can help, helps us to make the right choices in life. Because scripture, scripture is not only philosophical, it's practical too. Hmm. Although Krishna advises Arjuna, kill him, Arjuna did not take it. This is consciousness. Even though there is duty, 
we have to see what will be the effect of their duty. Nothing should be done blindly. This is the nature of a devotee. Okay, this is about 174. This is about Asvatthama. When Asvatthama killed the six, the five sleeping sons of Draupadi, then, um, you know, he was apprehended and uh, Bhima wanted to kill him immediately. Draupadi wanted to pardon him because she knew he was also a son who had a mother and being a mother herself, she was thinking, I have just lost my sons, so if, I, if he gets killed, this other mother will also experience the pain of the loss of her child. So although her children were killed, she was thinking about the mother of Asvatthama suffering because her child would be killed. So there was a back and forth discussion between Krishna, Arjun, Bhima, and Draupadi, what to do with Asvatthama. Krishna said, kill him. Arjun didn't do it. And then Arjuna took the cue from Krishna what that Krishna was actually trying to say. Krishna said something, but he, was, he meant something like, okay, kill him, but kill him in a particular way way. And he was testing Arjuna to show Arjuna's intelligence in this very difficult situation. So here, what is Prabhupada saying? Nothing should be done blindly. Nothing should be done. In other words, we should have some understanding why we're doing, what we're doing, what is the, what is the purpose behind what we're doing, and what will be the outcome of what we're doing. One of the principles of intelligence is to see the results before the activity. This isn't one of the principles of intelligence is that you're going to do something. What's going to be the result? Especially when something we're not sure of, then we should carefully think. Oh, maybe the results will not be good or counterproductive. And so this is a, a symptom of. Intelligence and intelligence comes from Shastra, from Guru, from Krishna, like that. Just like we're sometimes pushed to do something because we have a strong desire to do it, but we know it's wrong and we know the consequences will not be good. But because we're driven by this pushing, we find ourselves doing it against our will. And what happens, we suffer later, and we're sometimes we're sorry. So, therefore, seeing the results before the activity is a sign of intelligence. So Prabhupada said, nothing should be done blindly. This is a nature of devotee. Devotee is thoughtful. Not thoughtful where you don't do anything. You know paralysis by analysis? You've heard of that? You keep thinking where well, you just don't do anything. <laughs> Prabhupada tells the story where one caterpillar is dancing. Now a caterpillar has like a hundred legs. So that caterpillar was just a great dancer and everyone was saying, Jai caterpillar. And they were saying, you're the best dancer. So one bug came up to her and said, Mr. Caterpillar, can you tell me, do you put your 56th leg before the 64th or does it come after the 64th? When you move the 34th leg to the left side, what happens to the 44th leg? Does it go? So in other words, he was asking and the caterpillar was thinking, hmm. And then he started anal analyzing everything to the point of no activity. <laughs> Analysis, paralysis by analysis. So this is the opposite. Jai Shri Sri Kishore Kishore Gornitai Ki Jai Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharani Ki Jai. So this is the opposite of this. One should think about what is the results, but don't just think. Ultimately, one should follow that thought process with the, with the right action like that. Any questions related to this? Yes. 
We, you know, just, where's our microphone runner? We need somebody who's fast. We need a runner. There we go. We got, we got someone from the Olympics. Okay. <laughs> okay. Stand up and be ready to take the microphone to the next person. Yeah. Don't stand in front of that gentleman there. Okay. <laughs> there you go. This one? Faith is not blind, but it's created because something is authorized. Okay. Been following the process, so we ha have developed certain faith. But then there are new people who don't have uh, faith, uh, and they don't know that the process that we are following is authorized. So, f for meeting them for the first time, is it possible that we can actually give them some faith, or does it take time to develop? If you have faith, and when you speak, that faith will somehow become communicated to them. Uh, just like if you if you know if you have if you're practicing Krishna consciousness and you are, and you understand your practice when you speak you make a difference but if you're just you have some idea what's right but you're not following and you just repeat you may have some effect but not much so when you actually preach by example then that faith it becomes communicated easily strongly. So this is a good way to communicate by your own example. Now, if you're not doing that, you try in some ways to convince them based on what convinced you. Mm -hmm. So you can use different techniques and you see how people respond to what you're saying. By evaluating their response, you can think of ways to, you can think of things to say like that. If there's doubts, and, I mean, it's like getting a feel for the water. Mm -hmm. Try different things to see what works. Yes, Mataji, you have... Who's next with the microphone? Okay, in the back there. Actually, when one speaks with a blind faith, speaks, speaks emotionally and unconvincing and create the opposite effect that when one uh, speaks with faith, which is with conviction and... and Reasoning, yeah. understanding, using examples, using examples of what works. Prabhupada used a lot of analogies. He, a lot of times he would use analogies to explain philosophical points. Because we understand things by our experience in this world, using that as a reference. So yeah, preaching is, requires some practice. And, and as you learn, you start to adjust and to see what works. But you have to know your audience too, and that helps. <laughs> okay, so we'll jump back to where we were. Okay, where's this? London, Prabhupada dancing in ecstasy. Uh, so that's realization. <coughs> okay. Mood and mission. Okay. So what is the mood of our Krishna conscious movement? What is our mission? Someone read. Prabhupada and perpetuating that understanding within this con society. Read it again. Say it again. Understanding and appreciating the mood and mission of Srila Prabhupada and perpetuating that understanding within this con society and its members. Okay, so we're, we're exploring the idea of mood and mission. Okay. Continue, Mataji. 
Understanding of Srila Prabhupada's mood and mission gives us a clear sense of identity and purpose within his society and a balanced sense of one's place within ISKCON's overall mission. Okay, so trying to understand Prabhupada's mood and what is this mission. So we can see the mission here. What is the mood? The mood and the mission. Distributing prasadam, that's the mission. Distributing books, worshipping the Lord, having Harinam Sankirtan, protecting cows, Vanashram, like that. These are different aspects of the mission. And the mood is, what is the mood here? What, what can you say about this? That is the mood. Service. service, yes. Service. The mood is to serve. You can see that in every one of these. Okay. Okay. In conclusion, if a disciple is very serious to execute, execute the mission of the spiritual master, he immediately associates with the Supreme Personality of Godhead by Vani or Vapu. This is the only secret of success in seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Instead of being eager to see the Lord in some bush of Vrindavan while at the same time engaging in sense gratification, if one instead sticks to the principle of following the words of the spiritual master, he will see the Supreme Lord without difficulty. Wow, now that's a powerful statement. So by coming, by executing the mission in a very serious way, one can associate with Krishna. Sometimes they say, oh, I want Krishna, I want Krishna so bad. And Krishna, I can't get Krishna. Here's the, here's the formula. If you want to, you want Krishna to appear in your life, take up the mission of serving the Supreme Lord with complete conviction. Now, sometimes people want to, you know, they want to somehow or other read about the esoteric pastimes of Krishna and Vrindavan and think, oh, I'm so Krishna conscious. I can just explain all these things. But unless one is engaged in Krishna's service, as Krishna says, only those who serve me by devotion can get my association. Unal only by unalloyed devotional service can I be known as I am standing before you and thus be seen directly. Only in this way can you un un enter into the mysteries of my understanding. That's from Bhagavad Gita. Now Krishna says, by devotional service, you can associate with me and as that service becomes Strong one can see Krishna everywhere, always. So this is the secret here. That's from Srimad Bhagavan. Any, any questions, statements, comments on this one? You mentioned it's in the Bhagavad Gita as well, in addition to the Srimad Bhagavatam. So the, you, you just said, you mentioned it, there's a particular scripture in the Bhagavad Gita in addition to this uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavad Gita's preliminary knowledge of the absolute truth spoken by Krishna himself. Srimad Bhagavatam is the, the, the pastimes of the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the pastimes of the Lord's pure devotees. Bhagavad I was just Gita, trying to see if Bhagavad there was Gita a is preliminary and Bhagavatam is, is a more advanced understanding of spiritual practice and knowledge of the Absolute Truth. Both are required. Both are required. Okay. We're coming to the end. I know it's getting a little late, but there's only a few more slides left. Academic and moral integrity. that we have moral and academic integrity in the interpretation, evaluation, and application of Shastric knowledge. Okay, so integrity. So we'll go, we'll, examples of poor or dishonest use of scripture. Okay. Well, these are examples of poor or dishonest use of scripture. Go ahead, someone. The tendency to only quote half the sloka when I become complete quote, one gets the understanding of the whole thing. 
example would be okay the Continue. personality of god had replied the renunciation of work and work and devotion are both good for liberation so that that is a partial quote so that sounds almost complete the renunciation of work and work and devotion are both good for liberation any problem with that so what does it mean okay so next But out of two, work in devotional service is better than renunciation of work. So Krishna says both, but then he qualifies it by the second. So if we only quote half, we don't get the understanding. Work in devotion, devotional service is better than renunciation of work. But both are good for liberation, but this is better. Okay. Here's another example of the first statement. Choosing and quoting only verses, evidence that support our own opinion and neglecting others. Yeah, you just pick out different shlokes for different folks, right? And this sounds good. Uh, what does it say? All women are less intelligent. That's what it says in the scriptures, Haribo. <laughs> That's, so I picked that out and I used that just to bash ladies, you know. So what Prabhupada explains that, yeah, uh, that the principle is that on the spiritual platform everyone is fully qualified and fully intelligent. So using, just picking out different things to fortify your own ideas and using them to make a certain point or gain a certain particular uh, argument. In other words, you're motivated for a result and you look for certain verses that support your idea like that. Not seeing the whole picture. Does that sound familiar? We do that, don't we? Difference, yeah. And then the people who preach, they do that a lot of times. They look for those verses that only what we say, support their own personal vested interests, not the interest of Krishna or society. Any questions about that? Poor use of quotes. Okay. Citing context, uh, relevant materials as absolute truth or quoting out of context. Citing context, relevant materials as absolute truth. In other words, taking things out of context or quoting out of context. Taking, within, taking a particular point within the context and saying that that's the whole thing or just quoting out of context for the sake of just quoting. In other words, again, an example, poor use of scripture. Okay. Arguing or debating largely or wholly on the basis of emotional appeal. Okay, that's self-explanatory. Quoting a verse that does not actually explain that which we are discussing or whose meaning is unclear and or ambi ambiguous. Ambitious. Ambiguous. Ambiguous. Yeah. So, quoting a verse that doesn't actually explain what we're meaning or discussing. In other words, just quoting verses that seem like it supports what we're saying, but it actually doesn't. So examples of poor, dishonest use of scripture. Um, just like what Krishna says, manmana bhava mad bhakto, no, I'm sorry, um, what is that verse, 1866? Sarva dharma pariksa jamma me kam saranam vajam aham tvam sarva pape bhyo moksa yus. Abandon all varieties of religion. Oh, okay, don't be religious. <laughs> and surrender unto me. So Krishna is telling me to give up all religion. What is he saying? He's actually saying give up your own ways of thinking how you can become surrendered. Uh, how you can become advanced in devotional service and surrender to me and everything will be clear. That's basically what he's saying. So we interpret or misunderstand Shastra and we quote them in a wrong way. Or for what we say, personal gain, like that. 
Here, here's an example. Somebody is misusing the word soham, aham, brahmasmi, and therefore I am the supreme. But that is not. These are Vedic words, but soham does not mean I am God. Soham means I am also the same quality. Yeah, so quality is there, but quantity is different. So soham doesn't mean I am God. Although when you say aham brahmasmi means I am spirit, but you are not supreme spirit. So that's explained. Jai si si radha. Gokulananda ki jai. That's from, from uh, Bhaktivedanta Manor. I think this slideshow is a little bit slanted towards London. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> but they're all beautiful deities. She's, they're very beautiful deities. Okay. Responsible for learning. We must take responsibility for our learning and develop healthy study habits. Developing a taste and appreciation for the study of Srila Prabhupada books and understanding the relevance of Shastra within one's life will inspire us to study and study well. Understanding how we learn and what we must do to do facilitate our learning will assist us in developing the study skills necessary to learn. Mm -hmm. So, learning how to study and what is the relevance of scripture responsibility for learning not just learning for the sake of learning taking up the learning as a service to others and developing study skills okay okay here we go this sounds like what we read in the beginning all the devotees connected with this krishna consciousness movement must read all the books that have been translated Chaitanya Charitamitra, Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita and others. Otherwise, after some time, they will simply eat, sleep and fall down from their position. Thus, they will miss the opportunity to attain an eternal blissful life of transcendental pleasure. So, we read that at the beginning, right? Remember, for, that was one of the first verses. So, it's repeated here for emphasis. You see, Krishna Balaram Ki Jha. Okay, I think we're almost done. I don't have the numbers of the Shastras in front of me. Is there a way of seeing what number we are? Okay, I think I just went all the way back to the end here, beginning. Go down, all the way down the page until the end. Can you do it fast? Go down to the end. Okay, this is where we were. One should develop ability to see through eyes of Shastra with a Krishna conscious world. world. The ultimate goal is to realize Krishna is present everywhere and to see his hand in everything. So this is complete Krishna consciousness. What does that mean? Um, I'll give you an example. Whatever you see belongs to Krishna. This is Krishna's energy. If you see a person, that, and a person is Krishna's energy as a spiritual being within a material body. So if you see, anything you see belongs to Krishna because it comes from his energy and it's meant for his service. So that means seeing Krishna everywhere. If you think it belongs to me, you might be using it, and that is nice, but nothing belongs to us. Why? Because we can't keep it. <laughs> if something belongs to you, you keep it, but you can't. You have to give it up at a certain time. So this is realization to understand that everything belongs to Krishna. Krishna is everywhere, and everything is controlled by Him. Okay, another Personal realization does not mean that one should, out of vanity, attempt to show one's own learning by trying to surpass the previous acharya. He must have full confidence in the previous acharya, and at the same time, he must realize the subject matter so nicely that he can present the matter for particular circumstances in a suitable manner. The original purpose of the text must be maintained. 
No obscure meaning should be screwed out of it, yet it should be presented in an interesting manner for the understanding of the audience. This is called realization. So here's realization. To read something, to understand something, to somehow present it in the way that it was intended. So that takes practice, it takes realization, and it takes very, it takes you know, continuous uh, execution of one's devotional service. In other words, it's not an academic exercise. It's about understanding what is the purpose and how to present it in such a way that nothing is changed and at the same time one can go deeper and deeper into the meanings to present not different meanings, but meanings that complement the original meaning. This is seeing in scripture from different angles of vision without t touching the essential, without changing the essential principle. This is realization. <clears throat> and then of course the last part is to understand the audience and present it in such a way that the audience can understand also. This is called realization. That comes right at the very beginning of the Bhagavatam. Okay, we're, we're getting a summary now. Knowledge and understanding, personal application, preaching and application, faith and conviction, Prabhupada's mood and mission, evaluation, academic and moral integrity, responsibility for learning, Shastra Chakshush, realization. So that's a summary of what we just did. Okay, that's it. Very well. Any questions or comments? Shiv had one, okay, and then after Shiv, we have um, three questions, one, two, and three, four, okay, and five, yes. Marge, uh, I just wanted to, do you remember the, the tips, the ten tips for, yeah. for studying? The fifth one was um, cultivating an appropriate mood. Mm -hmm. This is the ten tips for well, we say prayer for reading, yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so cultivating an appropriate mood. Appropriate mood. What does that mean? In context of studying Srila Prabhupada's book. In a prayerful manner, that's the appropriate mood. Not that I'm going to simply learn and then I'm going to have more knowledge. I want to understand this so I can actually make spiritual advancement, purify my heart, and understand that this knowledge is coming from the realization of the great souls, which is their bhakti. <laughs> Prabhupada would say, my, my, my purports and the shastras are my transcendental ecstasies. That means they're highly developed spiritual emotions presented in philosophical form, form of the relationship between the writer and the Lord. So they're not just knowledge, but they're expressions of realizations of that relationship in different ways. So trying to approach that means we have to be in a mood of prayerfulness or in a mood of humility. Not that we're gonna have academic acumen and by our academic intelligence we're gonna charge and learn everything. So the mood is prayer. The mood is the mood is also wanting to understand. I can't understand, but I want to understand. That eagerness to understand. We don't read because it's an exercise that we have to do, but we read for understanding, we read for purification, we read the praise Srila Prabhupada. We read as a service, as we do everything for in the mood of service, we also read and study as a service for ourselves and for others also. It's not just simply, okay, it's about me. Mm. It's a service. Mm -hmm. Service means to please the Lord by the activity we're performing. We want to please Krishna by reading Prabhupada's books. Right. 
So the mood is right, the mood of my mood is I want to learn, I want to understand deeper, I want to gain some knowledge so I can also give this knowledge to others. So we might say the mood is also complete absorption. And that's in these ten steps, one of them is, you know, absorption in the subject matter, thinking about what's being read, uh, noting outstanding statements, and trying to understand them deeper. Another thing that wasn't mentioned, you can write it down. You can keep a pencil and paper next to you, and as you read, you write something. Some real, I do that all the time. It's, that's one of the ways I read books, is something comes up, I put it down, and then I have it, it stays with me. Otherwise, I may forget it. A lot of times, we get the moment, but the moment is only a moment. So we want to capture that moment through remember, remembering what that moment was like by writing it down. Does that help? Yes, Gormaj. Can I? Yeah. That's one other thing. Um, it's about context. So I agree that as generations go down, it's harder and harder to connect and understand the context of what Srila Prabhupada says. But then how, how, do, how does reading Prabhupada's books over and over again help with understanding that context? Because you can just as easily read over and over and again compounding the wrong context of what is being said. Then that's where questions come in. If you don't, if you understand the context, fine. If you don't understand it, ask. Mm -hmm. But isn't the argument that that by reading Sri Prabhupada's books we get the context? Because you can see the context, and if you see how it's presented in a larger sense, just like there's a series of verses, sometimes there are a series of verses that connect a particular theme. So that theme is the entire context of the, what is being explained. And each of the verses is, is fills into that context. So by reading it over and over, it becomes a little bit clearer. Just like now, we see devotees have taken the Bhagavad Gita and the Bhagavatam and taking, showing systematically how one verse goes, leads to another, and then there's a break, and then some new point comes up, and then there's another series of verses that are connected, and then there may be another break, and sometimes the series is longer, sometimes it's shorter, like that. It requires a lot of time and study to really understand deeper this. But we do that, you know, we do that in our life with other things, so why not with Bhagavatam? <laughs> Is that okay? I have more, but we can... Okay, it. yeah. Mm -hmm. In the back there, yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the class, and thank you very much for your saintly presence these days in this temple. Hare Krishna. Um, I recall reading in Srimad Bhagavatam, Second Canto, you may remember better the location, uh, of a particular instruction that Prabhupada gives to sannyasis to write their own books. And I feel that it's a little bit, it's referring to something a little bit more elaborated than just an autobiographical work. But suppose that that's also valuable. Uh, what, according to your understanding, what will be the importance of these books from sannyasis or Prabhupada disciples in maintaining this uh, flame alive throughout all these generations that you mentioned? Okay. And the other point that could be the should same I, question. Should I answer that one first? Uh, it, it is it's very related. Okay. And so the second point will be, I found or I find very, you know, very nice works in, uh, around, you know, ISKCON, like sannyasis have very nice academic works, very inspiring, and I may feel more compelled to distribute those books instead of Prabhupada books. 
So it would be a conflict. It will be a conflict if future generations fe feel more compelled to distribute these books instead of Prabhupada's books. Hmm. Because are clear, supposedly. Well, okay. The example is given. It's given by Prabhupada himself in an explanation. He says that all of Lord Chaitanya's teachings were were written down by the Goswamis. And he says, this is our tradition, to take what the spiritual master or the Lord says and explain it in different ways according to time, place, and circumstance. So he said, this is the business of our leaders in society to do that. To take what I've given you and explain it in your own words according to the audience. Without, of course, we've mentioned that without screwing out one's own individual meaning, keeping the essence, essential meaning intact, but presented it according to time, place, and circumstance. In other words, just like we teach chanting of the holy names of the Lord, but we also teach the chanting of the holy names of the Lord to different types of audience according to how best they can understand it. We don't tell them that you can chant Hare Krishna, you go back to Godhead. We tell them you should chant Hare Krishna because it relieves material, mental stress. So the point is to get them to chant Hare Krishna, and that's the goal. So they're motivated by a particular, uh, what we say, particular idea or desire. They want to get rid of stress, so they're chanting Hare Krishna, but ultimately they're getting more than that because the holy name also purifies their heart. So therefore presenting that knowledge according to time, place, and circumstance is the tradition. So Prabhupada said, you write books about my books. You write books about my books, but he says, um, without you know changing the essential meanings. This is the uh, this is tradition. Otherwise, you know, and Prabhupada's books are very hard to understand for some people, especially Western audiences. So taking that knowledge and breaking it down into more simplified terminologies would helps to for people on the day to day level to understand these things. So that's 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 what that statement refers to. Now the second part of your question. If that becomes the only factor, and then where, where is Prabhupada's books? We just The thing is, in those books, there's always reference to the source. In other words, we don't just explain Prabhupada's books, we also explain what was the intention of the author as he was writing what he's writing. So we connect everything we do with Prabhupada. As soon as we break the connection, and then we were starting to uh, create this idea that Prabhupada's, what Prabhupada said was nice, but it's no longer relevant today. And we need, we need something new, we need something different. But that's not the idea. The idea is to explain it in such a way to keep the content and the mood and the mission, but according to how the audience can best understood it, understand it. And we see, as time changes, people's mentality changes. The, the social climate also changes. What well, Prabhupada was speaking to back in the 1960s, that climate of those days was, is a lot different than today. People were giving up all their values, social, uh, family, ecclesiastic, and they were just throwing everything away and just looking for a new way of life. We were, we were rebels for the sake of rebels. That's pra Prabhupada's generation. We were just rejecting everything. Now people don't do that. They're probably, they more or less accept whatever society's giving them and they try to do their best to somehow fit in but at the same time make a difference. But, you know, so the climate is not the same as it was 50 years ago. So, therefore, presenting that knowledge according to time, place, and circumstance is important for the, day for, for the general audience in today's society. And you have different audiences. Like, when I preach in India, or I preach in, the, in Europe, or I preach in America, I basically uh, adjust the 
statements according to how people can best understand. I try. I notice when I try some of the strong statements in America, it doesn't work. <laughs> but if you use, if you speak just directly to people in India, tell it like it is, that's what they want to hear. Because that's, that's their tradition. You don't patronize. Here, you got to make it candy coated, sugar coated, package it, wrap it up, decorate it, and then somehow send it by, you know, you know parcel post and somehow. Because people don't want it here. <laughs> they don't want it. I just got a letter from a devotee today. He said, I've been preaching for in America for so long. I'm tired. I can't get anywhere here. <laughs> I'm going back so where people can be more receptive to the knowledge. And so it's hard to preach in America because people are stuck in their material ways of life. So stuck that they can't understand this knowledge. So time, place, and circumstance is relevancy. As Prabhupada talked about that, this is realization. So now the second part is we only distribute those books? Hmm. I would say that you can distribute those books, but at the same time we should continue to distribute Prabhupada's books. Both. Because there are people who will appreciate and understand both. We might think that this is, own, this is more understandable, but there are people who can, would, would definitely benefit by hearing directly from Prabhupada. And we have, to, we have to keep Prabhupada alive within our own practice. Otherwise, and there was a situation that I was somewhat around where one devotee was distributing this one, these books of one of Prabhupada's disciples. And he was glorifying, and he came back to this. He said, <clears throat> oh, your books are actually better than Prabhupada's books because people can understand them. And so this person also became a little bit proud and said, yes, now we should just distribute my books. Don't distribute Prabhupada's books anymore. Later on, that person fell down in Krishna consciousness. And some other devotees also left that person because he was so pretentious and so you get the idea that we can't cut ourselves off from Prabhupada and expect to get Prabhupada's mercy. His mercy comes with from, from his books, his letters, his relationships with him, whatever he gave us. Keeping Prabhupada alive means keeping the essence of the Siddhanta, what he gave us alive. That's why this you see this whole presentation was centered around Prabhupada. But then he wanted us to write books about his books also. So I would say you distribute both. That would be my answers. Okay, Agnivesh. When we're 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 actually supporting BBT. Actually, doesn't it, the, whatever, like we are supporting BBT, mm -hmm. Bhaktivedanta Trust, so that actually then gives an opportunity to publish more Prabhupada, print more Prabhupada books. Mm. So it's actually, in that sense, good that we should not stop distributing Prabhupada's books. Otherwise, I hope, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Those who are really successful book distributors have been distributing Bhagavad Gita's. Prabhupada said, book distribution means big books. <laughs> These little pocket books that we distribute are backups when people don't want the big books. But real the book distribution means Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, basically. Yeah. Agnivesh Prabhu. Yeah, Maharaj, thanks for your presentation. Good to see you. Uh, the question I have was on one of the slides, and it stated that uh, by having firm faith and following, executing the order of the spiritual master, one could associate with the supreme personality of Godhead through Vani and Vapu, I think. 
Yeah. So I didn't understand what that Vani and the Vapu meant. Vani means his words, Vapu means his personal association. So these books are non-different, the expressions are non-different from Srila Prabhupada. So you can actually associate with Prabhupada directly by reading his books. And then the words itself are a form of association because they connect, that, they connect you with the person through the instructions, which is the essence of association. Prabhupada said, you want to associate with me? Read my books. <laughs> That's what he said, and he said it many times. I'll, I'll tell you a personal experience I had, and it only happened once in my whole life, but it, was, it happened here in my room upstairs <laughs> many years ago. I was sitting and I was reading Bhagavatam, and I was reading, 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 reading for a long time. And then something changed. All of a sudden, I was hearing Prabhupada speak the words as if I was listening to a tape. I could hear Prabhupada's voice speaking the words from while I was reading the words from the book. So it was like listening to his audio. It went on for some time and it stopped. And then after that, and then I was thinking, oh, yeah, Prabhupada said, I'm in my books. Yeah, he is. <laughs> it's personally there. So he wanted to give me a little understanding of what he said. So. And that's there for everyone. If you, read, if you read enough, you can actually associate with Prabhupada directly through his books. That is the, that is the body and the Vapu at the same time. Paramatma, is it? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, one of the slides, uh, it is said that a preacher will sometimes do some mistakes like uh, imposing our opinions on uh, preaching. So, could you please elaborate and help me out to understand how does happens and how to stop it? Yeah, sometimes we preacher will like to sit in the and start managing the temple from the from the Bhagavatam class. The temple president sitting there and he's managing. <laughs> you should do this. You should do that. You should do that. Or sometimes someone complains. Like, I know I was in London about a few months ago and I was glorifying one devotee who was doing great amounts of preaching there. And this devotee also is controversial amongst other persons. So that controversial topic came up as a question and I immediately dismissed it. I said, this is not Bhagavatam, so don't even ask. So people want to draw you into a certain type of controversy to see your opinion in order to present their own, to fortify and back up their own feelings about something. Well, that's dangerous. So either their opinions or you can use your opinions to propagate your own ideas. <laughs> One should present the knowledge for the sake of the audience, yeah. Okay, was that it? Shanti, you had a question? I didn't want to get off to the subject matter, but there was something earlier about, um, I, I guess this mic is on, when you mentioned the true purpose, I keep feeling somehow we're missing it and we've become a group that we're sharing, like you mentioned vaguely, you know, you just touched on that. We're sharing amongst ourselves, but we're supposed to be spreading the word of Srila Prabhupada, and of course, purifying and teaching. And, yeah, we're doing, you know, yeah yes. we're doing both though. Yes, uh, and I still feel, because this is a big place, and it, I don't know if they're opposed to, I mean, every ethnic group we have in this room, there could be a little class or whatever, you know, whatever we can do, I'm preaching all day, I'm staying up all night, I meet people up in the street. But, you know, um, Donna Kelly, she had spoken on the contest of the book distribution, but every time we can, we should be doing this. And then you also mentioned something about, um, you know, our family, our little social group or whatever, 
but we're forgetting that we're not the body. So when we say your family, I, I wanted you to elaborate on this. I thought, if I'm not correct, we're only, we're pretty much born through a particular individual, but theoretically, we're not related on the spiritual realm. Is that true? Is that true? Could be. Yes. It's not necessarily true. I mean, could you don't be true, wanna... could be not. You yeah. take birth, karma, daiva, natrena, means you take birth according to your karma in your last life. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you have some connection with that soul who becomes your parent. And Okay. Because of your similar karma. Karma okay. is very similar like that. Okay. So, yeah, we're a family within the family. We have our nuclear family. But these things change life after life. And so you're in one family, one life. You're in another family, another life. But there's a greater family, and that's the spiritual family. Once you enter into that, then all living entities become your family members. And you see God as this, the Supreme Father, or the Supreme Source of that family. And everything centers around that relationship. So then, you don't, the actual understanding is you don't see, oh, this is my family, this is my country. You say, oh, all living, enti living entities are parts and parcel of Krishna, therefore we're all on the spiritual platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's, that's spiritual vision. <laughs> okay, well, I guess okay. somebody else. Yes, and under Vrindavan. <laughs> Thank you. How do you um, develop the taste again on distributing Prabhupada's book? How do you develop the taste? Again. Read the books. <laughs> <laughs> When you read them, you get the knowledge, and then you want to share that knowledge with others. I said again. Been there. How to bring it back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> just read the books, and then you'll become inspired by what you read. And you want to share it. That's one way. The other way is just do it. <laughs> Don't worry about the inspiration, it'll come anyway. But from the heart is when we're inspired. Okay, so thank you very much. I hope this presentation will cause you to now to dive deeper into what Prabhupada has given this great treasure house of spiritual knowledge, which is the source of happiness and the source of our, our connection with Krishna. Thank you very much, Shilpa Ki Jai.